Hi, welcome to my series into the world of black musicals, their history, and hopefully at the end of the series we can consider the question of what is a black musical? Today we'll be talking about the sensational musical called Once on this Island. The show premiered at the Booth Theater on October 18th, 1990. It's based on the 1985 novel called My Love, My Love, or The Peasant Girl by Trinidad American writer Rosa Guy. Guy's story is a specific retelling of The Little Mermaid in which an island girl named Desiree falls in love with an aristocrat man. There have been many retellings of The Little Mermaid, but the difference in this story is not only in his family's upper classness, but also in the fact that they feel that Desiree's skin is too dark for a boy destined for higher society's idea of oppressive power and wealth. Sadly enough, I had never even heard of Rosa Guy before I started doing research on this particular video, but I think her impact on this musical and the novel is too important to overlook. So I'm going to give a little bit of a bio about her life and her background in this story. Rosa Guy was born in 1925 in Trinidad, but she later moved to Harlem with her parents. Her parents unfortunately passed when she was very young after her immigration to America, and this led to her and her sister to go through a series of orphanage and foster homes. Guy was widely considered one of the 20th century's most distinguished writers for young adults. She addressed a subject that had remained largely unexplored in fiction for teenagers when she began her career four decades ago. I can't help but think that her childhood events like Immigrating and the death of her parents allowed her to want to write books for young adults who also had complex experiences. She has written over 16 young adult novels. A New York Times article states, Miss Guy's books were far from hopeless. Characters often transcended their circumstances through newfound self-awareness, and in particular through the capacity to forge durable bonds with others. This all makes sense to me considering the tragic ending of My Love and contrasting with the inspiring ending of Once on this Island, which we will later be discussing. Guy was also a part of the American Negro Theater, she co-founded the Harlem Writers Guild, and she was a member of the Black Nationalist Literary Organization called On Guard for Freedom, which was founded on the Lower East Side of New York City by also Calvin Hicks. If you don't know much about these organizations, just know that they were instrumental in Black literature and Black art. If you'd like to know more about the Negro Theater and civil rights, check out the book The American Negro Theater and the Long Civil Rights Era by Jonathan Chendell. That being said, the musical's plot remains similar to the novel. It revolves around a stormy Caribbean island night, where villagers band together to tell a story of Timun, an orphan girl who is saved by the gods from a treacherous storm. Timun grows up believing that she's destined for greatness and wanting to leave her small island town to beyond. Her gods eventually accept her plea to leave, on a bet in which they will make her fall in love with Daniel Bizome, a young, upper-class, and light-skinned man. The catch is that love has to conquer all for two people who are basically destined to never be together in society. While it ran for a total of 469 performances, it has had a long legacy in both schools and with its recent revival. It was produced by the Schuwer Organization, which consists of Gerald Schofield, the chairman, Bernard B. Jacobs, who is the president. It also coincides with Capital Cities and ABC Inc., as well as Suntory International Corporation and James Walsh. Its composer was Stephen Flarty and Lynn Ahrens as lyricist and librettist, both of whom collaborated on Anastasia, Ragtime, and Susical the Musical. Its director and choreographer were Graciela Danielle, who has a long-standing credit on Broadway as a choreographer. There was also Steve Marzullo as musical director, Michael Starbin as, on orchestrations, Loy Arsons on scenic design, Judy Deering on costume design, Alan Lee Hughes on lighting design, and Scott Leher on sound design. I want to take a second to highlight Alan Lee Hughes' work, who was one of the only black artists to work on the premiere of Once on this Island. Hughes earned his BA at a Catholic University of America, and then his MFA at New York University Tisch School of the Arts. He has been working in lighting for over five decades, which is pretty incredible. He's also worked all over the country at notable theaters, but he also continues to teach at NYC, citing his students as an inspiration. The cast of the musical consisted of Jerry Dixon as Daniel Bazome, Andrea Frierson as Uzele, Sheila Gibbs as Mama Uzele, Lashans as Timoon, Casey Lewis Evans as Asaka, Afi Clinton as Little Timoon, Gary McIntyre as Armand Bazome, Milton Craig Neely as Agwe, Nikki Renee as Andrea Devereaux, Eric Riley as Papa Gay, Ellis E. Williams as Tantan Julian. It's also got some pretty catchy songs like We Dance, Waiting for Life, The Human Heart, 
Forever Yours, Mama Will Provide, and Why We Tell This Story. There was also a song called Come Down From The Tree about facing someone's fears and reaching out into adulthood from childhood. Unfortunately, the song did get cut, but it was later recorded by Audrey McDonald, which we can now listen to. Come down from the tree Just open your arms and trust You know in your heart that one of these days you must And it's a pretty interesting song. It's not my favorite. I do think that Waiting for Life is pretty amazing. But I do see why some people absolutely love it. So if you'd like to check it out, there is a link on YouTube that you can watch of Audrey McDonald singing it. The thing that sets this musical apart from many other Broadway shows in the past is its embracing of storytelling and traditional black storytellers. It didn't try to be flashy or show off in any way. You see, the show's main focus is all about storytelling, which is why its set is fair and simplistic, allowing its costumes, dancers, and props to bring the story to life. The show tells stories in very black traditional ways such as through singing, um, like in the sad tale of the Bazomes, there's puppets, masks, dancing, and etc. It allows every one of its iterations to have fun in the way it showcases storytelling to its audiences. That's something that I really appreciate about this show. Yet, its revival packs a bigger punch at its attention to allowing black identities to tell black stories. This time, two black creatives helps on this show, but considering its premiere was in 2017, I can't completely praise it for its mostly, again, white male team. In my opinion, it's really not just enough to have diversity on stage in order to be equitable. Those same faces also need to be seen backstage, and two out of 15 people really isn't a lot. Um, there were many black creatives that are available and just as talented to do shows like this, and I'd love to see them included. This newer production did have Alvin Hoff Jr., who's the musical director, and Camille A. Brown, who had the role of choreographer. She is the first black woman to be nominated for a Tony in choreography in over two decades. Brown stated, I connected with Haitian American dancer and choreographer Maxine Montillis, and I've also had African dance training at the Bernice Johnson Cultural Arts Center and DeVore Dance Center, Brown says. There are names of African and Afro-Caribbean dances that we focused on. I did my best to translate the ideas in order to honor the culture and my voice. I have to trust myself and my instincts. If you'd like to read more about their amazing work, I've listed some links down below to interviews in which they talk about being black and about breaking the boundaries in a predominantly white industry. For this revival, the show was set in Haiti after the 2016 hurricane known as Hurricane Matthew, whereas the original 1990 production left the local unnamed. It's designed by Dan Laffrey, a talented designer who's worked on musicals like 2015 Spring Awakening. Yet, if this musical is about a community's resistance to a natural disaster, wouldn't it make sense to hire members of this actual community? I mean, the musical's main marketing tagline was about emphasizing resiliency. But yet, I wonder, is there a way to create art like this without exploiting those who received no financial compensation and relying mainly on white men to tell it? Again, to me, something feels a bit kumbaya, white gazy for a team of mainly white decision makers to set this revival in a way that depicts only black survival as beautiful resilience without proper nuances. This kind of strays away from Guy's main storytelling and her main themes, so I think there's need to be critical. I should make it clear that I'm not negating the fact that this show is indeed absolutely gorgeous, including the immersive set which included a live goat named Sparky, live chickens, real life pool and water features, and the costumes which depicted the gods as gender neutral wearing raw materials. My inner prop person must also state that, quote, before every show, Owen E. Parmley, the head of the show's props department, scatters trash all over the set. Soon after that, the cast emerges in characters to tidy up. This conveys a sense of rebuilding and double downs as a warm up for the actors. The crew also waters the sand on a daily basis to keep it manageable since it is susceptible to being kicked around. To get the texture he wanted, Mr. Laffrey had a New Jersey prop store mix two varieties of sand. Audience members also shouldn't be able to see them, but speakers are hidden among the everyday household items scattered across the sand to help the actors hear the musicians who are sanctioned above them and behind them. All of this is great, and it did allow the musical to receive Tony nominations. I mean, what prop person wouldn't want to work on this show? 
I also think the gods in this production are absolutely fantastic. Really, the entire cast kind of blows everyone out of the water. Yet, this is a deep dive into black musicals, and I'm not really sure how ethical it is to exploit black Haitian suffering and pain and turn it into a resistance story created by mainly white wealthy individuals. This all leads into the question of, does Broadway like to see shows and award shows that only show black pain and not also black joy through the eyes of white saviors and white voyeurism? I mean, the original won no American awards, and maybe that's because it wasn't set in a very specific place in the Caribbean. Also, I have to ask, what is authentically black, especially if in reality it's all fake for entertainment? For me, again, onstage diversity is not enough and I would love to see an all black creative team again like shown in The Wiz. It's not necessarily authentic to try and recreate an idea of what blackness is without truly knowing, or even trying to create what you think black resiliency is without truly knowing. Yet this revival certainly is powerful and it's wonderful to see black individuals in this way on stage. But again, it'd be nice to see the same energy reflected backstage and in the producing room. Alright, so now that we've talked about the novel's history, which was written by a black woman, and the musical's history, which is created mainly by white creatives, we need to talk about the changes made to the show's ending. Keep these changes in mind and think about how this contributes to what a black musical is and what it is not. Also think about what makes a black musical truly authentic, or if there's even a such thing as authenticity. This excerpt is taken from Jasmine Mako Bernard's essay called Once on this Island, My Love, My Love, or The Peasant Girl in Conversation. The greatest difference that we notice is that in the book, Rosa Guy does not shy away from the hard subjects, whereas the musical chooses to concentrate on positive subjects for the most part. In the book, the story concludes with Desiree being trampled by a large crowd while chasing the car of Daniel and their new wife as it leaves the gates of the mansion en route to their honeymoon. After her death, She's thrown on the side of the road and a large storm follows. It's a tragic end that seems to leave the story without resolution. But with more introspection, we realize that it isn't a lack of resolution, but a commentary on how black women constantly serve as casualties for the greater good and the progression of society. Furthermore, with this ending, Guy shows that there are specific structures of oppression that cannot be dismantled by love or by a singular person, but which must be directly addressed by all of society in order to be repaired. It is a social commentary, yet the ending of the musical is more happy and more inspiring than its source of inspiration. In the end of the musical, Timon dies because of her famine and exhaustion while waiting for Daniel to take her back. After her death, she becomes a tree, which the son of Daniel falls in love with a peasant girl years later. The transformation of her soul into a tree is celebrated as an honor and a spectacle, not as a sad and uninspiring end. There's a prioritization of the notion of forgiveness and of a love story. The musical is more optimistic end and on many levels more accessible. By shifting the attention from hard problems to more palatable subjects for all audiences, the resolution is more full of hope. At the end of the story, or the musical of the story, the story of Tamoon and the possibility of restitution becomes more like a dream than reality because it concentrates on the idea of post-colonial harmony rather than the methods to attain that ideal. I can't help but think that Once on this Island's white creatives unintentionally stunted the whole point of the novel, which talks about how to create actual change and the horrific and traumatic sacrifices black women actually make in our society that leads to our demise and sometimes our death without justice. Did the creators change this because they didn't want white audiences to be uncomfortable in the ways we treat black women? Do we often negate the valid statements in theater in order to make white audiences more comfortable and inspired than the actual truth? I would argue that we do. And again, if we take this conversation back to what Dreamgirls did, I think this is very important to show that maybe white creatives don't always see things in the eyes of black people, but again, they see this in this white gaze that is more palatable and accessible to all audiences. And if this is the case with Once on this Island, then eventually the musical exists in this white gaze and we can't remove it from it. So what is better? A flashy set that really immerses mostly white audiences into the world of Haiti or a simplistic set design that makes the audience use their imagination even if they have no idea what they should not be noticing. I'm not sure, but let's talk a little bit more about its impact and then I'll get into the whole question. While its Broadway original only holds a Drama Desk Award for Best Actress in a Musical, shout out to Lestrans here in the States, and a Laurence Olivier Award for Best New Musical, the show still has an impact. 
It still performed at many regional theaters across the country, as well as in high schools. There's even a film in the works to be on Disney+, Plus, which will actually be directed by two black women, which I'm very excited for. I also want to point out that Once on this Island for me was really the first Broadway show in which I saw black people naturally embracing head wraps and their short afros. And Once on this Island, I got to see people who really truly looked like me. And to this day, we still rarely see Broadway with people with natural hair or head wraps. There's also someone else who would like to talk about their love for Once on this Island, so I'm gonna let them go ahead. So Once on this Island has impacted me in so many incredible ways. When I was in high school, professional theater actually came and partnered with my high school and we got to do a mini version of Once on this Island and I had the opportunity to perform and not only perform, but do a show that has people that look like me and representation is just so important. Then again, when I went to college, that was one of the first shows that my college did in undergrad. And then again, I got to see it professionally when it came to Broadway in Chicago. And it was one of the last shows I saw before the pandemic. And this show just means so much to me because again, it shows the variety. It's not just one type of person. It's not just one archetype of a black person, but you're seeing such a range of characters with such depth and complexity in their emotions and in their storylines. And ultimately it's like an island version of Romeo and Juliet. The music is incredible. It makes for great audition songs. And as a performer, I deeply appreciate it. This musical also mentions very specific historical events in relation to the Caribbean Isle, like French colonization, the Great Ones, the Great War, and the origins of colorism, as well as positive affirmations of the gods in non-European religions, like voodoo and hoodoo. There are still very few musicals on Broadway who discuss this, so it's pretty impactful. So let me do my best to try and wrap this all up into a nice conclusion. I'm not saying that one cannot still enjoy this musical. We absolutely can. I will continue to dance around my room to Mama will provide as much as possible. But I am also disappointed. I mean, wouldn't it have been amazing to stick to Guy's prolific point about how much we expect black women to sacrifice themselves and their well-being? I mean, wouldn't it have been jaw-dropping to see the expectations we put onto dark-skinned black women and the ways in which men of lighter complexions reject us due to white supremacy? Because of all of this, Once on this Island is and is not a black musical. It is a black musical if one separates it from its original book source's ending. While it lacks a strong of an ending, it does beautifully depict Haitian and black diasporic culture. Not to mention that it's one of the few shows with a darker skinned black woman who does not have to fit the independent and strong mold. Tamun is interesting because she's allowed to be feminine, she's allowed to be smart, she's allowed to be kind, and that is truly special. Yet. If it is not a black musical, if one regards the book as extremely prolific and essential to the black womanhood experiences in its ending, does this musical really understand what it means to be a black woman or does it ask for once again a problematic love conquers all message? I mean, how could a black musical ever rely on the extremely damaging aspect of forgiving and rewriting an alternate version of history without reckoning with how black women do not often get a fairy tale ending? Can we claim that this musical really ever has its original creator Rosa Guy's concept in mind? While researching, I found very little evidence of Guy's involvement in the musical process, except for one photo in which she's holding a playbill, which means to say that she does know that the musical existed and she did see it. But how much was she really involved in this? Don't we want accurate portrayals of our struggles? Especially if one believes that something intrinsically is tied to the white gaze can never truly be or authentically coded as black. It's hard. I mean, it can also be both. If one decides that once on this island is an evolving source that we shouldn't be separated from the book or the white gaze. I mean, why shouldn't black women get to have both as long as we critically examine the issue? Don't we deserve gorgeous depictions of blackness as well as being able to discuss it in its issues? I mean, blackness in itself is its own coded language of authenticity, and we can't really say what is authentic and what isn't. Besides, don't black women deserve to see themselves in a fantastical and fairy tale ending? I mean, who wants to see black women constantly struggle in every single narrative? In my own opinion, I fall in the both it is and it's not a black musical. This is because I'm obsessed with the white gaze and integrating how and why it exists. I personally think that we need to get as far away from the white gaze as possible in order to find a whole representation. And if you'd like to read more about the white gaze, Toni Morrison's book called Playing in the Dark 
has the answers. Yet, I also don't speak for every black person, and I also often long to see works in which black women get to live and have joy and survive without struggle. I love mytho black mythology, and I'd love to see more of that, and I think Once on this Island does that, for sure. I fully believe that black women should also get to have fairy tales. Once again, black musicals and their ideals, especially when it comes to white audiences, how they compare to their original sources, and who their creatives are, is complex. Maybe this makes a musical distinctly black. Maybe this weird paradox, complexity, the evolving, the expanding, and the constantly messy ideas of what it means to authenticate one's own identity and the ways in which colonization continues to dominate in both the stories we weave and the stories we put on stage is what makes a Black musical. I mean, that's a pretty complex th train of thought, but I think that that makes some sense in a case. I mean, think about all the musicals we've recently been reviewing. I mean, I've still been conflicted with them. But Once on this Island seemed very particular to me, especially because it has such a rich original source, that is Rosa Guy's original novel. As messy as this gets, I do know that I will certainly be putting Rosa Guy's novel on my reading list, and I think that you should too. However, I'm thinking things may be more clear once we interrogate another Black musical, made by Black creatives this time, called Jelly's Last Jam Next Week. So join me next week on my episode series. Hope to see you there. Bye.